I want to start off in Luke chapter 22 and just for a few moments think with you about what we're going to do at the end of this service. And here's what Luke says. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this, is the, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And there is where we get this idea of gathering together for communion. And here's what I know. If you take just this one event by itself, it may not mean very much. But if you come at it from the understanding that this is a part of a bigger story, it starts to make more sense. And there are some deep lessons, I think, in what we just read, some things that God wants to teach us. For example, that you can't assume that life is always gonna go the way you want it to go. The disciples' whole lives have been built on the teachings of the Old Testament, right? Like they're living what you and I are reading now. They were living it then. So all they had was the Old Testament. And the Jews were a very devout people. They had a rhythm to everything that they did. There was this lens through which they viewed their lives and they viewed the world around them and certainly through which they viewed their faith. And it all centered on a simple promise that God made to a guy named Abraham. God had promised Abraham that if Abraham would place his trust in him, then God would build a great nation on his shoulders. And they would in turn be blessed as a people, but not just to be blessed as a people, that God would in turn use them to bless the whole world. And so there's this idea ingrained in every person's soul of I'm blessed to be a blessing. And they held on to that promise. You can trace it throughout the entire Old Testament. It's, it's just all there. And for centuries, they had this idea that God was going to bring in a Messiah, somebody that would set things right, that everything that the Israelite people had been through, there would be justice that would show up one day. They would get the leader that they were longing for, even if they didn't understand what it was that this Messiah was gonna save them from. And so for centuries, it was all about holding on to this idea that God was going to fulfill his promise. And then one day, a young carpenter named Jesus shows up. And he was a rabbi. And this was not the first time that a rabbi showed up in their community. It was a common practice in their day that teachers would come and they would go. And when they came to a town, they would look for people that they thought had the ability to, to at least do what they were doing, if not even more. And they watched as these teachers would select their disciples and every single time they would be passed over. But when Jesus comes, Jesus one by one starts to choose the least likely people to be his disciples. And sure enough, they're so blown away by what they do that they all make the decision that they are gonna follow him, that they're gonna become an apprentice and try to learn from him. And so they spent years listening to him teach. And they would watch as he would heal someone. They saw him stand up against the religious elite. And for a while, it was unbelievable. It was like they thought right before their eyes, they were seeing finally, once and for all, that God's promise was being fulfilled, that this idea of building a nation that would be blessed by God and that God in turn would use them to bless the entire planet. This Messiah that they'd all heard about since they were this tall, sitting on their grandparents' lap on the front porch, finally, this is it. Jesus is the Messiah. For three years, 
They built their entire life, all of their identity, everything that they believed about the world and the coming kingdom of God, it was placed in this person of Jesus. But then just like that, they watched as the movement literally exploded, which is a great reminder that following Jesus does not insulate us from heartache and pain. There is no cosmic insurance policy that suddenly gets cashed in the moment that you and I give our lives to Jesus. It just doesn't work that way. And it would be awesome if that were true. If the second that we said yes to Jesus and invited him to be the Lord of our life, if, if everything just suddenly went exactly the way we thought it would, that would be fantastic. But that is not the way life works. It's not that we get every wish from the bottle when we rub it. It's that we're no longer alone, that we don't have to go through this by ourselves. So you can't allow your circumstance to define you. I think it's part of what Jesus is trying to communicate in this meal. All of us know how prone we can be to tunnel vision, right? Like something happens in your life, you face some circumstance or there is a detour in the way you thought your life was gonna go and then suddenly that feels like that's all you can focus on. And if you aren't careful when you face something like that, your life can just become stagnant and it doesn't happen overnight, you just sort of ease into it and before you know it, it just feels like you're stuck. And you end up not growing and you stop moving forward in your life and that can lead to fear and anxiety and it can cause us to feel incredibly isolated and alone. And what I find really weird about moments like that, we've all been through them, is that over time, that feeling of failure or that feeling of coming up short or, or that feeling that something's missing and that feeling of being stuck, it becomes so familiar that there's a certain kind of fear or anxiety that wells up inside at the thought of, of, not no, of no longer having that with us. It almost becomes like our best friend. And that ends up fueling the fires of despair. If you know the story of the disciples in that moment when in the movement exploded before their very eyes and Jesus had died, they ran away and they ended up hiding in an upper room. But thankfully, God is big enough to handle the future. Because while the disciples were convinced that everything was over, not that they would just be able to go back to their ordinary life, but they started to figure out, well, if the Romans could kill Jesus, then why would they not come and kill those who were following Jesus? They thought everything was over, and yet God wasn't through. Because the scriptures tell us that just exactly the way Jesus said it would happen, it happened. That after three days, he came out of the tomb and he appeared and he restored Peter, right? The one who had denied him not once but three times, who had pledged his allegiance saying, look, I don't care where you go and I don't care what you do, I'm all in. Even if I've gotta lay down my own life, I'm there. And then the moment life got difficult and he was confronted with the reality, do you know this guy or do you not? Peter couldn't even come up with the right words. He's like, no, I've got no clue who he is. Jesus comes back and he brings restoration and healing and restores a sense of hope to Peter's life. He erased every one of Thomas's doubts, patient enough with Thomas's unbelief to allow him to touch the wounds on his hands and in his side. And then he ended up bringing redemption to the rest of his disciples. In fact, the scriptures tell us that they got so inspired by what they were witnessing, by what seemed like an impossible situation, that they ended up leaving everything behind again. They did everything they could to, to try to give Jesus away to somebody else. They even ended up suffering unimaginable deaths all because God kept his promise. All because one night they gathered together in a room with their very best friend all because on that night, they shared a simple meal. It's all because of a loaf of bread and a simple cup of juice. Now here's what I know about us. Sometimes in our day, because we all have a tendency to go on autopilot every once in a while, 
It is easy at a moment like this to get distracted, right? Grocery lists, plans for this afternoon, all the things that you gotta do this upcoming week, right? A lot of us have tomorrow off, so you gotta hit the ground running on Tuesday. Maybe it's just simply human nature, but communion can become something that's kind of a tacked on exercise in a worship service. But that is not the way it went in the early church. The writers of scripture took communion with this intense seriousness. In fact, <clears throat> Paul writes, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now that, you know, hey, that's pretty tough. Not like, hey, focus up and let's do this. It should mean something to you. Like, you're committing a sin. I don't wanna do that. See, the reason they took it so seriously is because of what it actually signifies. Jesus said, I want you to remember me. Why? <laughs> because of what it cost him. It's an interesting thing in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul refers to communion, what we're about to do as the Lord's table. And this phrase is kind of striking. In our day, you can just kind of skate right over it and it, it's really no big deal. But in Jesus' day, who you had dinner with and whose table you got invited to and who you invited to your table, that was a really, really big deal. In fact, Jesus got in a lot of trouble because of some of the tables that he went to, primarily because he made a decision that he was gonna eat meals with the wrong kind of people. He ate with prostitutes. He ate with tax collectors. He ate with general sinners, whatever that means. He ate with people that the good, upright, religious people would not eat with in a million years. And if you're familiar with his story, you know that that got Jesus in a lot of trouble. And on top of that, Jesus grew up a very poor man, never had a home, never had a table, always went to a meal as a guest, but never the host, except for this one time when he said to his friends that they would share this Passover meal together. He even had to borrow a room and hope that that room had a table. And on that night, he said to his friends, I have eagerly looked forward to this meal with you. Now this is the only time that we know of where Jesus actually hosted a meal. And what he offered at the table and what I think he's still offering to us today was all that he had, which is his, himself. It's his body and it's his blood. This right here, friends, is the Lord's table. And he still invites some pretty questionable characters. Because the truth of the matter is, he invited me. And yours truly is far from perfect. There is so much in my life, there are moments where I feel like I'm the last guy on the planet that deserves to be able to eat this meal. And that invitation is extended to you as well. And I know some of us, we're thinking right now, that's the reason our attendance is always down on the first Sunday of the month, because so many people feel like they're unworthy of coming to take communion, because we do it the first Sunday of every month. And we do it on purpose, because that's the point, right? Like none of us are worthy, all of us, no matter where we are in life and no matter what level of success we've reached, no matter how far down the path we are in our relationship with Jesus, none of us deserve to be invited in the meal. It's the same thing that Jesus has been doing from the very beginning, looking for the least, the last, and the lost, and the most unlikely people to share a meal with them. <clears throat> he gathered his friends, and the scriptures say that he took a piece of bread, and he told them, I want you to eat this on a regular basis. And as you do, I want you to remember that it's my body which is broken from you. It's my hands that got nailed to the cross. It's my side that has been pierced by the sword. It's my head that has been torn by a crown of thorns. And then he took a cup of wine and he said, I want you to drink this cup on a regular basis. And I want you to remember that it's my blood which is poured out for me. I'm dying so that you can ultimately live. And then he said those words, do this in remembrance of me. 
<laughs> now, I imagine in that moment, if I were a disciple, the thing that I would be thinking is, Jesus, how could I possibly forget you? Like, you chose me. You called me out of my ordinary life. I've been overlooked the whole time, and yet you showed up, and you saw something in me that nobody else saw and that I don't even see in myself. I've watched you. I've listened. I've seen you bring healing. I've watched you live your life. I get that the kingdom's coming. Jesus, how could I possibly forget you? But of course, that is the problem with the human race, is we do forget. I forget Jesus all the time. <laughs> there are so many moments in my life when I look back and I, I know that I have forgotten that I am actually forgiven. And sometimes I get burdened with guilt. There's this need to remember. Sometimes I forget that I'm called to be a servant, right? I get impatient and I run roughshod over somebody else and I forget that it's my job to actually serve them because I always focus on trying to get my own way. There are moments that I need to remember. Sometimes I forget that I'm a part of a family of brothers and sisters and I, I end up feeling alone and isolated like nobody knows what I'm going through. Sometimes I forget that I've been created to be absolutely free and I allow myself to be held hostage by what other people think about me. Sometimes I forget that God wants me to face life head on with courage and I allow fear to start to creep into my life. I mean, if I'm honest with myself, I forget Jesus all the time. And I would suspect if you were honest with yourself, there are a lot of moments that go by where we don't even think about Jesus. We want to, we know we should, but life, man, it comes at you 24 seven. The clock is always ticking and busyness is the great enemy of the human soul. Sometimes we get so distracted by life, we don't think about Jesus. That's, that's what this meal is about. It's about remembering. The ability to remember, it is incredibly powerful. <clears throat> that's why as a culture, we build memorials. That's why so many of us take videos and pictures. We wanna be able to go back and remember that moment that happened. That's, that's why some of us still fill up scrapbooks. There's a lot about remembering in the scriptures. In fact, one scholar says that the entire Old Testament represents what he called a theology of remembering. In the Old Testament, God would call his people to build altars out of stone and it would be that ability for them to remember generations down the road because pillars of stone would never fall and they would never crumble and so Anytime somebody would go by, they would know that marks a moment that God wanted us to stop and to remember. He instructed them to, to literally tie the law on a string and bind it around their fingers and then put it on their doorpost so that every time they went into their home, they would be reminded of, of how much God loved them. And in the Bible, remembering, it's more than just recalling information. From a biblical perspective, when you remember, what happens is something that was real in the past can become real once again. Something that was real in the past can become real again. A lot of years ago now, the first time I ever served a church, it was a church in Cartersville, Georgia, 45 miles north of Atlanta. And um, I was fresh out of college, Beth and I had just gotten married and we had just moved so I could go to seminary. And there was a lady in that church, um, her name literally was Martha White. And um, she lived up to that name. Um, her deal in the church was she fed the preachers. And so she, um, bless her heart, has gone on to sing with Jesus, but is responsible partly for the way that I look today. Because she did not want lean preachers, she needed robust preachers. Um, unbelievable cook. But one day Martha comes to me and um, she asked me if I would help out with her parents' anniversary. And um, it's the first time I'd ever done something like that. I mean, I was 24 years old. I had no clue. I was still figuring out who God had called me to be. And so it's Martha White, right? And you don't tell Martha White no. And so I was like, yeah, I'm all in. Now, this was a special occasion because her parents 
we're going to be celebrating 65 years of marriage. And uh, so we had this celebration. And the one thing that her mom and dad wanted the most were the songs. Um, those songs that they wanted to hear were the words of the music that they grew up to and ultimately fell in love listening to. And there's something about music, right? It just stirs our souls. So we gathered together in the large room. There's a couple of hundred people there to celebrate. And the guests of honor were sitting in two chairs next to each other. And they, you know, have white hair and um, covered in wrinkles. And they were both on canes and they were wearing trifocals. And um, y'all, they began to hear these songs. And these songs expressed the love and the memories that they had shared for 65 years. And you could tell physically that they were beginning to remember. And you could tell, she looked at him and in her eyes, he was not this old, wrinkled, trembling shell of a man anymore. He was once again that young, kind of strapping, strong, handsome groom that she had pledged herself to 65 years earlier. And when he looked at her, he didn't see what anybody else saw. He didn't see wrinkles and white hair. He just saw this slender, smooth skin, raven-haired girl of his dreams. Then they stood up and they began their last dance together. And it took them forever to stand up. <laughs> and I would have made fun of that a lot of years ago, but I do not make fun of that now. Um, like it took every ounce of energy inside these two human beings. But y'all, when they stood up, man, it was, it was a picture of grace because their backs were straight and her face was lifted up toward his. And you could watch 65 years literally melt away and in that moment, they were a young bride and a young groom, and it was all because of just one song. It's an incredible experience. Happened almost 30 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. They walked in with all of the help of the room, like most of us were thinking, I hope they make it to the end of this. And then one song starts to play, and it changes everything. See, Jesus said to his followers, I want you to remember. I want you to remember. And if you come at it with the right heart, this is part of what makes bread and juice become a sacrament. There's something holy and something sacred about that moment. Present in the past becomes present, in the, becomes present once again. See, Jesus is the host at the only table that he ever had, and he offers us the only thing that he and his poverty had to offer, which is himself. And now it's our turn. This is our moment. And what is so remarkable about this is Jesus is here. That's why communion has to be redone and redone and redone. That's why we do it the first weekend of every single month with rare exception. It's because we understand that over the course of any given month that most, if not all of us, are gonna keep on sinning. And some of us are gonna keep on messing up and some of us are gonna keep falling down and we're gonna be tempted to live a life of despair and we're gonna be tempted to think that God has given up on us. There'll be moments when I'm tempted to think this time, have I gone too far? And it's at the table that Jesus keeps saying over and over, no, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna love you. Come back, meet me at the table and remember not your guilt, remember not your failure, not your shortcomings, not all the ways that you've sinned, but you just remember one simple thing, that I laid my life down for you, that you have been set free, do this in remembrance of me. Now, I don't know about y'all, but for me over the years, these have become very holy moments. Sometimes when I come to the table, I simply remember that I've been saved. And I remember when I first understood that God loved me and as best I could turn over my life to him, I remember that moment that I gave my life to him. And I remember that if it hadn't happened to me, 
I can't even imagine where my life would be right now because I can honestly say that giving my life to Jesus, everything that is good in my life, it can be traced back to that one moment. Sometimes I come and I gather at the Lord's table and I remember a deep regret. I think about something that I'd done in the recent past that was messed up and I feel that regret. And I remember, oh yeah, I'm, I'm forgiven. I don't have to let that have the power that I've been given it in my life. Sure, it's not okay and it's not excusable, but I'm forgiven because of what Jesus did. And in that moment, I'm really, really grateful. Sometimes when I come to the table, I just think about him, what a great man he was and about how much he loved me and about the price that he paid when he went to the cross. Sometimes I come to the table and I think about the people in my circle of influence who are struggling, who are hurting, who've gotten diagnosed with something they didn't see coming or who find themselves standing over a hole in the ground or, or something happened at their job or going on with one of their kids. Sometimes when I come to the table, I just, I'm reminded that while the world is not the way God wants it to be, it ain't over till God says it's over. Sometimes I come and I just gather at God's table and just simply taking the bread and sipping the juice reminds me that I'm not alone, that no matter what's happened to me over the previous seven days or the last 20 years, that there's still a reason to have hope. And so the question I have for you is what do you need to remember? What did you bring with you today? that you thought you would keep suppressed for an hour and you'd deal with it when you walked out of the room again? What do you experience when you come to the table? This is the one thing that we do that I think completely levels the playing field because it doesn't belong to us. It's not a Cokesbury thing. It's not a United Methodist thing. It's God's table, it's not what you and I do, it's what God already did. And the reality is to, to, to join God at his meal, you just gotta be a believer in Jesus. Now it doesn't mean that if you don't know who Jesus is, you can't take the bread and the cup, but it won't mean anything. But for those of us who are following Jesus, there's something about stopping long enough to remember that he gave his body for us. There's something about stopping long enough to remember that he poured out his blood, not just for the human race, but specifically for us, that we might be set free from our sins, that we might have an opportunity to make a difference in the world, that we have the ability to finish this life strong and to go on into the next life in all of God's glory and God's grace. So I've got some friends who are gonna come and help me serve communion, and hopefully you're paying attention during the video because we're gonna find out right now who is paying attention. <laughs> um, but listen, I don't want you to panic. Um, we give you instructions because we want to make it as easy as possible, but if, if your row goes to my right and you accidentally go left, it's gonna be okay. Just find your way to somebody that's got the cup and the juice. I want you to know the altars of our church are always open if you'd like to kneel and pray would encourage you to do that after you take the elements. If you need gluten-free, you're gonna come right to the middle regardless of where you're seating. If you're watching this online, I hope you've got it together. I'm gonna to ask um, my friends to come on up and to get ready and I'm gonna pray a blessing over this and then we'll have a chance to come together at God's table. Gracious God, I give you thanks for the gift of this day and I thank you for your word that teaches us that life may not go the way we want it to go and that there may be moments that we feel like we're struggling, but you're big enough to not only conquer our current circumstance, but you're bigger than whatever we're gonna face in the future. I thank you for the gift of coming to your table for the bread and for the juice. And God, I pray that as we receive these elements, that you'll bind us together as a community of faith, remind us that we're all in this thing together. Would you speak deeply into each of our lives? Don't allow this just to be some mindless thing that we do at the end of the service, but God, Meet us exactly where we are. And if nothing else, remind us that we are not alone. Because if we can walk out the doors with that feeling, we'll, we'll be set up to have a great week. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen.